Good afternoon and welcome to all of you all joining. We really thank you for being here today for our, web, our webinar on um, special considerations when addressing substance use disorder in the reentry population. We will get started in just about a minute, so stay tuned. All right, it is two o'clock and I just want to welcome everybody again for joining us today for uh, the next in our webinar series about substance use disorder and today's topic I'm, I'm really excited about. We're going to talk about the reentry population and the special considerations, uh, maybe some, some pros, some cons, some challenges when addressing substance use disorder in the reentry population. I'm really excited for the speakers we have uh, with us today. And um, without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. I I'm gonna introduce myself. My name is Barbara Campbell and I am the executive director of the Dalton Foundation uh, and the Relink.org project is one that we support. By, quite honestly, our biggest project that we do. I'm gonna share a little bit about that. We have a couple of our team members on today. We have Brittany Hall, who is our communications uh, coordinator and supporter for the state of Ohio. And then we have Bill Pika on as well, who is our data coordinator. Uh, Relink.org does have over 10,000 resources in the database and, and Bill is at the forefront of maintaining that information and updating it and engaging with all the providers on the site. So I'm really thankful for the great team we have. Uh, Brittany, would you change the, go to the next slide, please? All right, for those of you that don't know, I just wanna do a few words about Relink.org while everybody continues to join in. But Relink.org is a uh, online, it's a free tool. This has been uh, a, a project of love from the Dalton Foundation for the state of Ohio uh, to just aggregate all the resources around the state that are available to help people in need connect with community resources and help to restore restore lives. So that's been our passion from the beginning and it's, it's evolved, originally started with just addiction resources uh, for addiction recovery and now we've blossomed out. And um, I must say that re-entry resources are our most popular, our most searched. Um, and we're actually really excited about that and all the work we are doing with the re-entry community. Uh, we have designed relink.org. Like I said, it's free to be on and free to use. We don't want anyone to Nothing plays favorites. It's just about creating the information and connecting people. And if you can search by county and category and city, um, very easy to use. And anybody on our staff could help walk you through it if, if you needed it as well. Brittany, do you mind going to the next slide? And we just wanna highlight really quickly family resources. This has been a big focus for us for the past um, year of adding family resources to relink.org. Uh, I'll share in a minute, we've been working with Dr. Borland and the base camp recovery team on a, on a family focused project. And we're really excited to have these resources go live. They went live uh, on May 1st. So we're very excited to create awareness about it and encourage people to log on, use the resources and also give us feedback uh, as well. All right, Brittany, so let, next slide. Without further ado, I want to uh, introduce our speakers to you today. I'm going to introduce all of them, uh, one after the other, and then I'm going to uh, turn it over to Director Pride to share a little bit about her work uh, in this area. Little disclaimer, um, we don't have uh, Angie Lee on as of yet, so uh, she is working to get here as soon as she can due to some unforeseen circumstances. So the plan will be to share, have Director Pride share then Dr. Borland, and then um, Angie, uh, when and if she's able to join us. 
So we're, I'm really excited and thankful, uh, Director Pride, that you could join us today. Um, Director Pride, she has been a public servant leader with over a decade of experience in juvenile justice, youth and adult mentoring, prevention, intervention, advocacy, and organizational management. In addition to her role as Justice Policy and Programs Director, Rochelle serves as Executive Board President with the Unity Community Center, which is a minority-focused 501c3 serving in Delaware County. And one thing I just wanna add, I'm, I'm meeting her for the first time today via Zoom in person, but I think one of the most uh, telling things about people is what other people say about them. And as we joined on the webinar, seeing Dr. Borland light up and talk about Director Pride uh, as being so impactful with her innovative approach. Uh, I don't know, it just made me smile. Like I said, you don't see that every day. And so tells me a lot about you and your leadership. So I'm really thrilled that you're here today. Brittany, can you go on to the next slide, please? Thank you. And Angie Lee, uh, hopefully she will be able to join us, uh, is the Executive Director of Safe Harbor Peer Support Services serving Delaware and Morrow counties. Uh, she attended the University of Dayton for her undergraduate and Tiffin University for her graduate work in criminal justice administration. She is dedicated to supporting uh, others in both the public and the private sector. And Safe Harbor Peer Support Services provides a welcoming environment where adults um, with mental health and addiction concerns can receive peer support and wellness programs to work on their recovery at no charge. So we're hoping and praying she can join us as well. And last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Brian, Brian Borland, who is the medical director at Base Camp Recovery uh, there in Columbus, which is a comprehensive addiction treatment facility that provides uh, vital, medical, vital medications and life-changing counseling to help patients regain control of their lives and climb to new heights. And I gotta say a little bit about Dr. Borland too. We've been working with him on a project uh, to help support families um, uh, that, are, that have a loved one that's struggling with substance use disorder. And it's been just a joy and pleasure to work with him. I've been impressed by their work and also his personal story and commitment to this. So I know he'll share a little bit about that later. So without further ado, I want to turn it over to uh, Director Pride for her to share a little bit about the work they're doing. Awesome. Thank you so much, Barbara, uh, for having me and such kind words. Um, I'm so excited to be here today. Um, I shared with the team before we got on that um, this is this is certainly my jam. Um, this is certainly uh, my population of love. My labor of love um, is reentry um, in all things uh, justice. Um, and how we be more equitable and how we are more intentional about the work that we do. So um, a little bit uh, more about myself. Um, as Barbara stated, the Franklin County Office of Justice Policy and Programs, as well as CASA of Franklin County is what I am. I have the pleasure of overseeing. Um, our work here in justice policy is geared towards being that uh, centralized criminal justice planning authority to our Franklin County Board of Commissioners. Um, I would be remiss not to first um, share about those amazing individuals. Um, our president to the Board of Commissioners, uh, President Erica Crawley, uh, Commissioner Kevin Boyce, and Commissioner John O'Grady, um, and our county administrators, uh, Kenneth Wilson, um, and our deputy county administrators, uh, Joy Bivens, uh, Eric Janis, um, and Chris Long. We are so thankful to have such a leadership team. Um, I need to preface everything I'm gonna say with that because we all know it starts at the top. And when you have a dynamic group of leaders who understand and who see people, um, they see the problem and they want to make sure that everything that we do is truly for every resident every day, um, you have to be grateful for that. Um, because in many spaces, as we work with those who need us the most, um, we have to know, we have to first understand from a human centric approach, um, the why. We have to understand why it's so important to be engaged with the needs of people, um, understand the difference between treating the symptoms and treating the whole person. Um, and really our team here at Franklin County has been amazing. Um, next, I will be remiss not to highlight the team itself that makes up justice policy and programs and CASA of Franklin County. 
Um, I have never had the privilege of working with such a dynamic team um, and really who are, are who really are dedicated to, to the people, um, even more so than the work itself. Because many of the things that we do every day um, is truly a matter of the heart. It, it, it becomes a heart thing a heart thing before it ever becomes a head thing. Um, we know what the data is going to uh, reveal, which we'll talk about a little bit of that today um, and share about some of our work. But at the end of the day, um, you can't teach passion. You can't teach um, people how to care. Um, you, you gotta know and you gotta understand uh, how necessary that is before we can even get to the work that has to be done every day. So the Franklin County um, Office of Justice Policy and Programs, our focus here and our mission is to be that uh, comprehensive planning agency um, in the sphere of justice for our board of commissioners and county administration um, and serving all of our justice municipalities um, and making sure that both in the public and private sector, we are that conduit. We are that disruptor. We provide that continuity of care and support. And we really focus in on what, um, where the problems are, where the pain points are, but also where the successes are where we're collaborating um, effectively and we're doing great work to serve people, um, but also again, making sure that we identify training, technical assistance needs, strategic planning, um, all of the things that's going to make sure that we are being, um, again, intentional and meaningful in the service that we deliver. Um, we also are ensuring that we take care of those who are in charge of service delivery um, and making sure that they have the tools that they need in order to serve to the, their, their greatest capability. Um, I often say in many spaces and places that we first have to be clear um, about what we consider reentry to look like. Um, and reentry is very acute. Reentry is that space where we want to make sure that immediate needs are met, that social determinants of health are addressed. But the longer term goal should be that true reintegration, making sure that our residents and our neighbors who are returning from an, a carceral setting are positioned to be able to thrive rather than just survive. Their position to be uh, to get the resources to where they're truly reintegrating into their communities and they have all the equipment that they need to be successful from day to day. Um, and so with that, we are also the um, fiduciary agent for the Board of Commun uh, Commissioners and making sure that a lot of the federal, state and local funding that's passed through um, that we are allocating that appropriately to sustain and be innovative in new projects and also making sure that diversity, equity, and inclusion is at the heartbeat as well of what we do um, to ensure equitable justice. Um, we also want to make sure that we are enhancing the quality of life of those that we serve through our services. Um, another major component to the Office of Justice Policy and Programs is our recent launch here in Franklin County of uh, the one door concept, where there's no, one, no wrong door for anyone who is seeking our services through our health and human services pillar. So that is comprised of and led by, first of all, our Deputy County Administrator, Joy Bivens. Um, and it's comprised of the Office of Justice of Policy and Programs, Child Support, Job and Family Services, and the Office on Aging. And what we believe and what we strongly integrate into that model is the human services value curve. How we focus on first, where we getting us from what we know to be that regulative business model, where we're focus, focusing on transaction, just getting people what they need and okay, go on and have a great day. Um, we are building from that and making sure that we are focusing on collaboration, that we're focused on being integrative in our work, and that we get people to the generative part of the model where they are starting to see that lifelong transitional change that is embedded in what we are working through in all of those other phases of the model. Um, so it's very, very human centric, um, less process driven, more people driven. Um, we're not over applicating and over processing people. We're taking a time to make sure there's alignment in the health and human services that we provide. So this is very, very exceptional and, and will be a breath of fresh air for our residents. Um, but it also for, as we talk about the reentry population, um, it is long overdue. One of the things that we were able to glean from some of the data as it relates to even our opioid epidemic and how it impacts our reentry population is that first understanding the heartbeat of what's happening locally. Um, making sure that we have a pulse realistically on how substance use, um, addiction, how it is impacting our reentry community um, and our community really as a whole. So Franklin County, um, we, we really very early on accepted the notion that this is no longer um, a opioid epidemic. It has become an overdose epidemic. We are losing people 
um, every moment of every day to the influx that we've seen with the opioid epidemic here in the state of Ohio and here um, in Franklin County, and it has only gotten worse. Um, one of the data points that I wanted to highlight was during the first six months of the calendar year 2021, um, overdose deaths in Franklin County increased 73% from the same time frame in calendar year 2019, 73%. And we know that from 2019 to 2021, one thing that we entered, which was unprecedented and still unprecedented, is a pandemic. And so we know how much um, that exacerbated these numbers, but inevitably these are the numbers and these are the people um, that have been impacted. Um, we reflected back and looking at the entirety of 2020, 804 lives were lost um, to overdose, 84% of which were directly attributed to fentanyl exposure. We also looked at a period in March of 2021 um, we looked to see um, where we had a nine day um, rolling average of overdose surges resulting in the death of 34 individuals. So that's even scaling that year metric that I gave you down to a literally nine day period. At, any, at a given point, March of 2021, we lost 34 individuals in nine days. And so for us, we are very, very clear on how critical this is and how consequential it can be if we do not continue the work, continue the efforts, garner the resources, be more react, more proactive versus reactive, and ensuring that we are putting the right pieces to the puzzle in the right places to get our residents the help that they need. So despite significant prevention, education, interdiction, and response efforts, the opioid-related per capita overdose death rate in Franklin County, Ohio is still at the top compared to the national uh, per capita. So we understand that with the national average at 64.5 overdoses per 100,000 people versus the Ohio rate of 47.2. So if nationally we're at 64.5 per 100,000 people, we are very, very much at the top of the list at 47.2. And we have to continue the work um, and continue to support, not just um, fiscally, but collaboratively, our resources, our partners in ensuring that um, we are we are really getting to the bottom of this. So in that vein, I do wanna talk about um, some of the things that we have started to work on and have been efforts for many, many years now here in Columbus and Franklin County to really address this epidemic. Um, some more um, really quickly of the things that, you know, kind of helped us get to this point of, of garnering the solutions that I'm gonna talk about is looking at data findings as it relates to our carceral setting and our residents who have been um, incarcerated, who are being released. Um, one data study that we were able to overlay with our Franklin County Sheriff's Office and our Franklin County Coroner um, was understanding based on our, with the utilization of our jail management system, the jail history data for our residents who have lost their life to, to a drug overdose. So some of the 2020 data findings was that 67% of those who died in Franklin County from an overdose in 2020 were known to be in our jail. 19% um, of those who died in Franklin County from an overdose in 2020 were incarcerated within one year prior to their date of death. Another 13% of those who died in Franklin County was in our jail just six months prior to their death. And 5% of those who died in 2020 were incarcerated just 30 days before in our jail system. So I don't know about all of you, but this is extremely disheartening to know. And so my mindset and the mindset of our, our office, the mindset of our board of commissioners and county administration is to act. What can we do to mitigate the impact that we see from these numbers? Um, one of the things that we began to implement um, circa 2014, 2015, um, is we began looking at, okay, how is it that we start to collaborate um, and that we're not duplicating efforts and sending people to a million different places to get a million different things that we could work together to offer um, in a more collective impact approach. So one of the things that we focused on was making sure that we came together with our partners um, to create the Franklin County, Columbus and Franklin County um, Addiction Action uh, Plan. And so what we wanted to really make sure was that when we focus on the data that I just shared with you, that the addiction plan committee comes together 
to really say, okay, where are we at in the space of prevention? Um, where are we at in education? Um, where do we need to be as it relates to how we create this continuity of care across sectors? Um, so just a little bit more in depth about the um, Columbus and Franklin County Addiction uh, Action Plan. We really, really also wanted to make sure that as we began to double up on some of the, um, the efforts, that there were also subcommittees because we understand this work is a heavy lift. This is not something one entity, one, one person, um, one department can do. We truly have to figure out, okay, what is it that we want to zero in on as our target? What are our metrics? What are the outcomes we wanna see? So um, again, back in 2015, um, there was again, an increase that we noticed in the deaths for those who were battling addiction. So in 2017, the Franklin County Opioid Action Plan developed um, with again, our community partners, Columbus, Franklin County, um, to really figure out how we stabilize um, what was happening in the short term and in the long term while offering important long-term prevention strategies. Um, again, so focusing on being um, proactive versus reactive. So with that, Columbus Public Health did assume leadership of the um, addiction plan uh, committee. And it, this, is, this is when we renamed it. Um, and we restructured to make sure that we were better addressing not only the opioids, but all types of substances and that lead to addiction. Um, the new plan clarified objectives of intervention areas and tactics that included, again, the faith-based community, um, healthcare and risk reduction, treatment and recovery, public safety, as well as education and prevention. Um, we were able to, in 2020, get our plan endorsed by the city of Columbus, um, our mayor, our city of Columbus attorney, as well as our board of commissioners and the Franklin County, the Columbus Public Health uh, Commissioner. Um, so three of the goals that we really wanted to hone in on um, was decrease in overdose deaths by 15% annually. Um, so far in 2022, very preliminary metrics, we are doing well. We are, we are meeting those metrics and we're continuing to see that decline. Um, right now we're working to figure out all the factors that that's attributed to. So this is very preliminary data, but I'm excited to see the numbers drop nonetheless. Goal number two was a decrease in drug overdoses by 15% as measured uh, by the emergency department visits that um, were related to suspected overdoses. Again, thus far, those numbers are showing us that um, in comparison to the total of 2021, where there were 5,703 visits to the emergency department due to suspected overdose that we are now seeing thus far in 2022, 1,316 is what's been calculated so far. So again, this is very you know early, even though we're midway, kind of getting into midway of the year, um, we're still early and we're doing better than what we started in 2021. So we are, we are happy to see that. The third goal was to decrease newly reported hepatitis C cases by 10% annually. So again, wanting to make sure that as we look at the numbers to where we are, uh, where we've been historically, we wanted to make sure that that is something that continues to be ramped up as a focus for our 2022 projections. Um, Pre-release medicated assistant treatment programming um, is one of the things that we worked very closely with our sheriff's office um, here in Franklin County to ensure that we were able to get one, a um, very collaborative jail medical services provider, um, a medicated assistant treatment coordinator that assists us with coordination of MAT services pre-release. Um, this coordinator meets with individuals who are selected at booking as high risk for opioid use disorder. Um, and they focus on making sure that they are facilitating the harm reduction in the jail and ensuring that high risk individuals are released from jail with a Noxalone kit. So some of the findings that we were able to glean from that in 2021, um, we noticed that with the clinical opioid withdrawal scale, which is what we use in that process of the medicated assistant treatment, um, that we were act able to actually screen about 2,700 2, residents through that CALS protocol process. Um, we were able to get um, another 847 screened for, with a MAT coordinator, another 544, then were linked to MAT services. Um, we were able to distribute over 2,000 Noxalone kits, um, and almost up to that amount, very shy of that 2000 mark, were actually taken and accepted by the residents as they were ex exiting the jail as a part of that MAT release. Um, so we were able to also make sure that we started to collaborate better 
and we focus on pre-release MAT support groups with base camp recovery. So this is something that we've been able to work with Dr. Borland and his team to make sure that we're working through um, getting a lot of edu education, a lot of preventative measures and supports embedded in our carceral setting. So this has worked out tremendously and we're continuing to be innovative and creative in that. Um, the pathways to achieving recovery by choice um, this is a program that now is a national model that we implement with Alvis Incorporation. Um, and Pathways is um, achieving recovery by choice. The program is designed for justice involved residents identified at the Franklin County Correctional Center and exhibited high risk for substance use and overdose. And this again is determined by that CALS protocol that we do have our residents um, utilize in determining their, their need. Um, we look at this as a pre-release and post-release support um, to decrease the use of the illicit drugs and strengthen pre and post release um, efforts in, in that continuity of care. So what we utilize is our peer supporters to make sure that they are staying connected and we do some comprehensive recovery management planning and peer support services in that. Um, lastly, I will share our uh, Rapid Resource Center. So I'm excited about our Rapid Resource Center. In 2021, um, our office developed, um, it's co-located at our Jackson Pike facility here in Franklin County, a resource center um, that is in a non-confined section of the jail. Um, the services, we, we serve this kind of as a one-stop reentry and fast track to treatment for individuals just released from the jail setting. Um, it's open to their family members. It's open to anyone who um, is just, again, in need of service linkage to a hot cup of coffee. We want to provide everything from meaningful conversation um, to be an ear to listen, to really allow people to feel welcome um, and supported as they exit. And we are soon launching into 24 seven operations. So right now our rapid resource center at the jail operates first, second shift. We're moving to a 24 seven model. Um, we are looking at also in the process of building out um, as we are on the precipice as opening a new jail uh, many of you will hear me say this, I, I will never be excited about building a new jail, but if I had to have one, they have certainly been intentional in the design of our new jail to be more therapeutic, more human centric. Um, and I'm telling you, it, it's something that you, you would be in disbelief to see the a work that went into creating an environment that is truly the goal more so than not to be punitive is out of the window. We are trying to be restorative. We are trying to focus on, yes, for this time that you're here, we get why you're here, but we are not judge, jury, and executioner. You have been charged. You have not been convicted. So how do we go back to treating you like a person who one day will get out? And as I said to the team before we got started, and a very close colleague of mine um, with our social services team at the jail states so eloquently, today's inmate, as we refer to them, is tomorrow's neighbor. Majority of the individuals that we serve are coming home. So it's our job as a community to embrace them, to make sure that they have the supports and resources um, better coming out than they may have had going in. And so through our Rapid Resource Center and the great peer supporters and the team that we have there, it has just been a transformational thing to watch happen, what has been made available. So with that new jail setting, there will be a Rapid Resource Center 2.0. We are, again, in the process of designing that space. So that way it is a true, holistic, uh, trauma-focused, trauma-centered approach in how we work with our neighbors as they are exiting um, our carceral setting. Um, so just a little bit of success numbers as it relates to our Rapid Resource Center. Um, since our establishment in February of 2021, we have had 1,713 walk-ins to our Rapid Resource Center. We've had another 1,141 of those residents serve through service linkage. Again, support services, continuity of care, and simply just being an ear to listen. Uh, the number of linkages to MAT and substance use treatment services, 96, and we distributed Noxalone kits in the amount of 50 for those leaving out of the Rapid Resource Center who felt that it would be necessary for them to have or to give to a loved one. Lastly, we work very closely with our March program out of our municipal court here in Columbus. Uh, Matt, it, the March program is focused on MAT assessment, referrals, collaboration, and hope. The March program is an expansion of the courts MAT uh, program that, that focuses on the holistic approach again with those residents who come down to our government system, uh, government towers, and they're, folk, they're into the system some kind of way. And we're just really trying to make sure that we're offering things on site um, to make sure that they're, they're, the direct service linkage is available to them.
Um, we have a safe station location that we're doing in our community. So it's very, very important for us to meet people where they are so we can assist them and where they need to go. So our safer stations will launch um, this summer. Um, and this will be a place that's located on the west side of Columbus in Franklinton that will allow residents the ability to walk into a space that is where they reside. Um, and they can get everything that I talked about earlier um, in the form of our rapid resource center and some other intentional services as it relates to um, you know, addiction and, and harm reduction education. Um, and so we have a lot of pop-up events. We do a lot of, again, collaborating even in the source of funding um, to make sure that we are getting intentional dollars that in, are dedicated to the intentional efforts of working with the residents who need the support the most. Um, so I just really you know, want to take a moment to hone in on, again, just the importance of us focusing on this as a matter of the heart that will then lead us to the mind of how we conceptualize and we begin to share and support people in a different way, that we begin to understand um, that nobody wakes up one day and decides that this is the life that they want to live. Something happened that shouldn't have or something that should have happened didn't. And so it's very, very important to understand that at the end of the day, no matter what all the things that we see as a symptom, all the things that we see as a, a matter of, of, of a problem or a pain point, there's a person behind all of that. Um, and it's very, very um, a huge focus for our team here at Franklin County to make sure that is always at the forefront and that we are focusing on every resident every day. Um, in closing, um, we will have, starting this week, we launched our Health and Human Services mobile unit, um, which will be down at the Franklin County Government Tower um, every Tuesday and Thursday from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Um, we are so, so excited about what we've seen just in this first week. It has been transformational. It has been tear jerking. Um, and it has certainly been um, an experience. Um, and so again, people just need someone to care. And um, again, as, as my colleague says so very well, it does not cost to care. So thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Director Pride. Uh, Dr. Borland, you are not kidding. Uh, Dr. Director Pride has a lot of innovative ideas and the amount of things you have going on. I don't think I've ever taken so many notes. Um, and uh, thank you all for your questions and comments that, that have come in. Uh, we are getting a request for, for some of your notes, by the way. I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'll follow up with you because you shared some incredible statistics with us um, about you know, how the overdose rates have gone up and the statistics of those coming out of incarceration and then all the things you are working on to create, you know, I don't want to say creative, that's maybe not the word, but just thinking outside the box and all the ways that you can support and help. And, and what comes across to me so much is, is your caring and thinking of people as an individual. And I just love that. And I just want to thank you for that. And to know that that's at the leadership where you're at is just, uh, I don't know, it's so encouraging. So if, if you all have questions, I think what we're going to do, if you want to type them in the Q&A or the chat, we're going to gather them. I'm going to go over and let Dr. Borland uh, share for a little bit about um, his work, kind of maybe from the clinical perspective a little bit with this and the work that they're doing there at base camp. And then we should have uh, plenty of time to address uh, all of your questions. So Dr. Borland, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Barbara. Um, I don't know uh, how I can uh, even come close to following that act. Um, yeah, good luck. I know, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I could just, we could just skip half. <laughs> um, so um, some of the things at Base Camp that we, uh, that we share, particularly with Director Pride, um, is that we are really looking for those who are not uh, receiving treatment um, that should be receiving treatment. Um, and so the minority populations, um, as well as the patients, uh, the reentry patients, the LGBTQ patients, um, all of these groups um, are at sort of a disadvantage when it comes to treatment. And when it comes to the incarcerated population, it's always sort of just been the standard quo of um, this is just the way things are. Um, they come in here because they use drugs and then they leave and they never get any better. Um, unfortunately, sort of the joke is on us because we wouldn't expect a patient with diabetes to go into jail and then 
a month later walk out and not have diabetes again. It just doesn't happen that way. So with the incarcerated population, uh, it's very similar to this. If they have a substance use disorder going in, they're going to have that same substance use disorder going out. And the idea has sort of been that, well, this was their choice. And unfortunately, because of their choice, when we turn them loose, they're going to come right back and we'll see them again next week. Um, one of the things that I like about Director Pride is um, her idea that we should have a whole other focus uh, on this population. Instead of saying, you know, we'll just keep doing it as we are, you you're actually looking to set this population up in a manner in which they can best be successful. And, and that's been very refreshing uh, for uh, us at Base Camp. And it's, it's built a great opportunity to do some collaboration on work that um, has really been incredibly impactful. Um, to give you kind of an idea of what we started a few months ago, um, we began providing some treatment services uh, inside Jackson, uh, Jackson Pike. And we were, we were sort of a uh, test model. We were only doing about 10 patients at a time. Um, and uh, throughout that period, it was only two hours a week. So we, all, we were only there once a week. And right now, just in a few months, I believe we've had six patients that have come directly to treatment from that small group that we're actually having an impact on. And right now, uh, three of those patients are approaching six months of sobriety. Um, and it's just, it, it's absolutely incredible to see that success. It's even, it even far exceeds uh, my expectations going in. I was like, I hope we can get one person to come to treatment, that's a win. Um, but the amount of people who have followed up with us um, and who have been successful uh, is, just, is just amazing thus far. Um, Director Pride has um, sp uh, spoken with us at Base Camp, and we're looking to expand that program, um, and so we can see even better results. Uh, it's really just a different mind frame of we're not going to change anything. To we are going to set you up to be the most success to to achieve the most success when you leave here as possible. And um, <clears throat> in expanding that program. Uh, I also wanted to talk a little bit about the new jail. Uh, it's it's called a jail, but it's it's a treatment center. Uh, essentially, what it is, it's it's a it's a high uh, quality evidence based um, treatment center that provides excellent substance use disorder treatment as well as treatment for other conditions. And um, it's just a, a completely new world in in the field of the reentry population. Um, that they're going to receive such high quality treatment uh, at their disposal while they're in there. And so it really sort of uh, begins to change the, the frame of um, you're here, you're here to be punished, and you're just going to stay here, and then we're going to let you loose, and we've not changed anything, and you're going to go right back to it. Whereas now it's actually bringing people in and helping them uh, achieve new heights in their life, helping them get treatment uh, for addiction while they're in there and setting them up to fully succeed when they're released, decrease recidivism, decrease overdose deaths, um, and really make a lasting and impactful, um, uh, an impactful uh, statement to our community. So uh, with, with that, I don't want to take up too much time because I want Director Pride to have the ability to answer some questions that you might have. Obviously, I'm, I'm open for questions as well. Um, and one of the biggest one of the biggest things at Base Camp that we're really, really focusing on, uh, as well as Director Pride and Sheriff Baldwin, um, those who are in charge of the, the new jail projects and the bringing treatment inside there is MAT. Um, un unfortunately, we sort of have a dual pronged uh, problem. We have not only the desire to get people into long term recovery, which decreases recidivism and includes or uh, improves their ability to interact with the community, uh, to get jobs, to put families back together. Um, but we also have to recognize this problem that we have with increasing overdoses. Um, 
And so it, it really is a two pronged approach. Um, I, I don't know if I would have said that three or four years ago, um, but the escalation in overdose deaths and then the new um, drugs that are coming onto the scene, uh, we need to be prepared. Um, there's there's uh, drugs out there that are gonna be stronger. They're more potent. They're more likely to cause uh, overdose death. And um, we have to have our system in place to protect those who are incarcerated so that when they leave, they do not encounter uh, some of these drugs that ultimately would be a death sentence. Um, so it, it, it's a great program. I'm really excited to continue to hear more and um, I'll turn it back over to Barbara. Thank you, Dr. Borland. I really appreciate uh, you sharing uh, every time I learn more and more about what you guys are doing there at Base Camp. And I'm, I'm always so, so impressed. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat or into the Q&A section. We'll pull them out of either one. I do have several questions that, that I would like to ask um, if possible. And one thing I wanted to highlight to Dr. Borland that, that I've observed um, just from the outside looking in, I think it's kind of a statement of the obvious, but you know, we're, we're kind of playing a, a very different game now, even than we were playing a few years ago, which was a horrible game back then with combating the opioid epidemic and overdose deaths, but compounded by COVID, but also this uh, increased being laced with fentanyl and other things that are even worse, God forbid, than fentanyl, you, there's not a lot of room for error, you know, in um, reaching people right away because it only takes one time and it's too late. It's not, and so it's, to me, that's what's the, just the heartbreaking thing and just the, when you're dealing with the reentry population, as you said, if someone's struggling with a substance use disorder, even though they've been uh, without the substance perhaps for a given period of time, is when they are released and the, temp the triggers are there, the underlying disease state and, and biochemistry, as Dr. Borland has shared so beautifully on previous webinars is still there. And then you couple that with the fact that, you know, tolerance is gone, fentanyl is more prevalent, it's just a recipe for disaster. And, you know, seeing this happen, it's just, it's just heartbreaking. So hearing what you guys are doing right there in the jails to me is so exciting and so encouraging. Um, I've heard about this jail. I feel like I want to come down to Columbus and see it. I don't think I've ever said that. Like you said, Director Pry, I don't think we ever want to be excited about a jail. That's something we'd never want to see. We'd rather hear the fact that we don't have them anymore, but this seems so innovative. Do you know, is there anything like, is this modeled from something else in the country or is this something like new that, you know, I know a lot of innovation comes out of Columbus. I'm not from Ohio, but I've been impressed with some of the things I've seen coming out of the Columbus area. Is this new or is it something that's being modeled off of another uh, jail? Yeah, so we were, we did, our sheriff's office really took the lead um, years ago in really what this was going to look like. Um, I, I've just had the pleasure of kind of seeing it come to fruition. And prior to my inception, there was a lot of benchmarking happening both nationally and internationally to really focus on strategic inmate management, ensuring that, um, you know, again, we're treating like people like people. Um, our current designs of our, our many of our jail uh, buildings and, and, and settings are very um, archaic, um, very, again, not uh, humanistic or what you would actually even want to put an animal in. So um, we are certainly excited that, you know, we are moving to what Dr. Boylan very eloquently stated, that this is a treatment space. Um, we, we want to remove the connotation of it being this punitive, retributive, um, harmful environment. Um, people are already coming in in crisis. Um, so to embed them and lock them into a place that just gets more crisis is actually, uh, it makes no sense at all. And so what we're trying to understand is that this person didn't get here by way of, you know, what it is that, that we assume to be true. It's their life experiences. It's the things that we need to really uncover and unpack. And so the model of it, we would love to have you uh, come down. They've, they've had tours of the jail, um, again, from folks all over the country and even internationally have come to really see this model um, that has been developed. And, and it, is, it is breathtaking, it, it really is. Um, it was very intentional from the color scheme to the feng shui to simply even just making sure that a more trauma-informed uh, aspect is, is at the forefront. 
I'm really excited to see the impact that the, something like this is going to have because I'm just a big believer, you know, as you guys have said over and over, treating people as people, understanding that there's a why behind the reason they're in the circumstances they're in that we may not understand and we certainly don't know. Um, I think, and then just having the, being in that environment in and of itself would have to have some level of healing. So that's really, really uh, exciting. And then Dr. Borland, I had a question, I guess it's kind of for both of you too. Is the program that you're doing that you're kind of piloting with, I think you said 10 individuals in the jail, like is there plans already to expand that? I assume this will kind of go on as the jail uh, opens and that will expand. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, we're working with a very innovative person that is making sure that the program expands rapidly. Um, and so we are super excited about that. Um, it, it, it's very rare to see um, two people that understand substance use disorder so well as Director Pride and Sheriff Baldwin. Uh, I mean, it, it has been astonishing the uh, level of education and understanding uh, as well as compassion for a population that uh, many people uh, struggle with compassion for. Um, so that's that's one of the great things. I wanted to jump back to say real fast, Barbara, before uh, we moved further, that along with having the fentanyl and things like that, what we're seeing uh, in, in sort of the new uh, epidemic that we're beginning to see is the mixing of uh, fentanyl into other substances. And mm. I just want to point out that there was there was a really tragic event uh, here in Columbus uh, approximately a week ago where two students at the Ohio State University uh, unfortunately overdosed and died because they were they were trying to purchase Adderall. And and that's scary. Oh my that's, goodness. That's scary that's because here you are, you know, person that may not have a substance use disorder, maybe they want to just take some medicine to help them study. Study you know, for finals. The, yes, and they're in the prime of their life and they go and they take one pill. I mean, it, it, it's just unbelievable. The other part of that too, is if you put fentanyl in a stimulant, that mm -hmm. person likely has no tolerance to opiates. Yes. And so just the tiniest fraction of fentanyl will, will cause overdose in those people who don't normally use opiates. So it's, it's, really a, it's really a potion of death if they continue to keep mixing these things together because you don't, know, you don't know what you're getting. There's no way to sort of look at it and be able to tell. Uh, and so that's, that's a really concerning thing for us moving forward. I wanted to point that out and acknowledge uh, that event um, as sort of give you an idea too of what, what we're trying to predict in the future here as to how we can combat this uh, stimulant uh, slash opiate combination that seems to be passing around right now. Yes. And Barbara, if I may add, um, thank you, Dr. Borland, for bringing that up because um, I, I believe in making sure that we tell the story because it, it makes it more real to us about what's really happening right in our backyard. Um, a similar story we received um, even as young as elementary and middle school children mm -hmm. overdosed in bathrooms um, because of access to things that, again, they may have known what it was, may not, mistaken it as candy, who knows? But the bottom line is, is that we are now even having to have these conversations with children at younger ages than I would have ever imagined years ago. Um, I have a nine-year-old and I've had to talk to my nine-year-old who will soon be a fourth grader to say, if someone hands you something, and you cannot readily see and know what it is. It's not coming right out the packet, brand new opened as a bag of Skittles, you don't take it. That is a very hard conversation to have with a nine-year-old, but that's the world that we're in because of what we have, what, what children have access to, the lack of supervision, the amount of drugs that are just coming into our communities and being dumped and distributed. Um, it is, it's really deplorable and so, I just encourage, to your point, Dr. Boylan, we have to educate, we have to get in front of. Um, I know one of the staple programs to me that I will never forget, and people may have had their thoughts and feelings about it, but D.A.R.E. was everything. I remember everything I, I was taught in, D in D.A.R.E. program because it was that intentional. It was that in your face. Like we didn't have a choice but to go to D.A.R.E. 
Like we didn't, it, it was something that was the no, I didn't know that it wasn't a thing. You know what I mean? And, and I think that we've gotten away from understanding how important it is to get in as early as we can with sensitivity to the demographic, the age, we understand that. We know that there's age appropriate content, but I believe there's a way to deliver any message that could be life-threatening to a child because before it becomes a loss of life. Yeah, and I think when I think back, like you said, to the D.A.R.E. program, the curriculum now would have to be adapted based on all the new tactics and the new things that are going on. It would, I mean, I'm just generalizing, but it would have to be a much longer program, you know, than it was because of, unfortunately the the tactics are so much more intense, you know, and um, and I couldn't agree more with the idea of prevention for everybody out there that's working in prevention. Just thank you for all you guys do on the front line because you'll never know who you prevented from getting into this world. And it's just so important because, you know, these, for those of you who don't know, I'm a pharmacist by trade. So understanding the addiction of these drugs and how this works to me is, is uh, you know, just innate, I guess. But you know, the, the addictiveness of fentanyl, which is why they're adding it in, you know, to get people hooked longer, you know, and, and quicker. It, it's just terrifying to me. It's absolutely terrifying and how kids can get brought into it, not even knowingly, not even, it's not used to say, oh, it's one dumb decision or a couple dumb decisions. Sometimes it's not even their intentional dumb decision. And I mean, how many dumb decisions did we all make when we were young, right? And, you know, by the grace of God, we, we, didn't get fentanyl in our Adderall, you know? I mean, that's just, um, it's just crazy the challenges that, that the children are having to deal with these days to me. I mean, I sound like an old lady, but I am, <laughs> but um, it's it just heartbreaking, absolutely heartbreaking. So we had any questions, please go ahead and type them in. You could also raise your hand. I would be happy to let people uh, speak as well. We just have a few minutes left. Um, one question that did come over was people wanting to know how to help or volunteer. Um, I don't know if you guys have anything to speak to about that or something that we could send out about that as well. Yeah, we could certainly um, get you some information, Barbara, um, and kind of how our office is positioned. Um, a lot of the, the majority of the employees that are with our office, we are also a second chance employer, let me say that. Um, some of my most dynamic uh, administrators, supervisors, peer supporters are credible messengers as I refer to them. They are subject matter experts of life because they've been through um, what a lot of our residents are currently experienced in a carceral setting and outside of that. Um, so volunteerism and just finding ways to kind of intern, um, we can certainly send some information of kind of what we do as a uh, board of commissioners agency um, to bring in internship opportunities, volunteer opportunities, um, because we, we, we have plenty um, that we could share. Great, yeah, if you could share those with us, we can get them out to people um, and see if we can help, you know. There's always people that wanna help, but it's harder to match people that wanna help and are able to help with the needs in an effective way. It's, it sounds so easy, but it is a little challenging. So any information would help. Dr. Borland, what about on your end? You guys are right there on the front lines. Um, yes, uh, I was actually looking through some of the statements um, and uh, I, ca I caught two things there. Uh, one about what can you do? Um, well, we created the site beginyourclimb.com. Uh, and if you go there, it's a free site. And there's a couple of uh, informational lectures there um, that you can create a login, whether it's a real login, your name or not, doesn't really matter. You can, you can uh, create a login and you can actually watch those four lectures uh, where we talk about the disease model. We talk about some of the biological behaviors and physiological behaviors that come with this disease. And it just gives you sort of a better understanding of it's not really a choice. Um, there's a whole lot of things that are coming into play there. And, and then the second thing that I, that I saw looking through these uh, is that um, uh, one of the questions was, or one of the discussions was about family members. And uh, we're seeing this more and more. There is a growing trend in the treatment of substance use disorder to where you consider the family dynamic, um, which is something that um, can have a huge impact because you, you have parents or, or loved ones or significant others that they don't know what to do. They don't know how they can help in this situation and how they might enable in this situation. 
And so if you can really sit down with the family and the person with substance use disorder, everyone's communication gets put together, everyone's on the same page. Um, and it's, it's, it's really, I think, going to become uh, an important way that we do treatment here in the near future. Um, at base camp, we do these services. I typically uh, am the one who will meet with the parents and family. Um, and it's, it's actually one of my favorite things to do is to actually sit down with the family, with the person with substance use disorder. I really enjoy those conversations. Um, and I'm excited that the field is sort of heading in that direction. Absolutely. And I think, Dr. Bull, and one of the other questions, too, that were in there about family members and, and the access to um, different models and, and fentanyl test strips and things, our Safer Stations location will offer the fentanyl test strips, um, and we will, you know, make sure that that is something that we incorporate into that service model. Um, and as far as family, um, I've always been a huge champion and supporter of the idea of inclusive family engagement that you cannot just deal with the person, you have to deal, there's somebody connected or there's multiple people connected to that person, um, children, um, other caregivers and supporters. And so that is one of the reasons that for our Rapid Resource Center, why we allow it to be a walk-in, not just for the resident leaving um, the jail system, but also for their family members as well. Um, we wanna be able to connect anyone um, who feels they are in need of anything, that they have been bold enough um, and vulnerable enough to come in and ask for support in getting. So um, no one is turned away in that aspect. Um, and we make sure that that is something that is, uh, a, is a known facet of the program is to ensure that, that that's happening. Another thing too on the piece of, of prevention, you know, one of the things that um, I've, I've been able to have the pleasure of doing in previous work is trying to create a space where we're working with individuals who are at risk whether it's at risk for a mental health crisis, at risk for um, substance abuse disorder, at risk for um, suspension from school or entering into a, a jail system. If we see that people are struggling at a certain point in life, for me, when it was a child, if I seen at five or at seven that this young person was struggling with some things, why are we waiting until they're 13, 14 and 15 with a criminal record um, to say, well, what's the problem? Well, they were displaying that there was a problem well before we got to this point. So again, it, it, I can't hit in enough how important it is to be preventative, to pay attention to people, to listen to people, to observe people and, and be that conduit to what it is that you could do to really support a person who may be in need of something when it's really preliminary, it's very acute before it becomes a longer term um, you know, life sentence for them and how they are dealing with and moving through um, the struggles um, because it's, it's very much um, necessary. Um, aside from you know, what we incorporate in this work, I'm a certified professional life coach. So I, I truly, truly believe in making sure that we're getting to the root, again, back to that integrated model of working with people in a human services approach. We really, really got to get to the root. And people, whether they want to or not, eventually whatever it is they're struggling with, it, it, it rears its ugly head. You, you eventually start to see something is right, is wrong. And, and, and you know that people have to be willing to, to want and give that exchange of vulnerability, to give you the opportunity to lend that support. But more often than not, people are ready and willing to have the help. They just don't know where to go and they don't know where to start. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. It was making me think of something that Dr. Borland has shared in a previous webinar with us about catching things early. Like I know Dr. Borland, you said, every, by the time someone comes to your treatment facility, if you were ranking their disease state, it would be, you know, on a scale of one to 10, near 10, and how much you would love to be able to start talking to them and addressing the issue more when they're at a stage one or two or three, mm -hmm. before there's more damage done and before it's harder to treat. I, the same model with any disease, right? The earlier you can treat it, the better. And, and as you were speaking, Director Pride, it made me think of the many things I've learned from Dr. Borland. <laughs> So, Absolutely. Absolutely. And one other thing, encouragement I want to offer you guys too. Again, I said this one other time as well from the, you know, kind of more the outside looking in, we get to be involved in a lot of different webinars and talking to a lot of people around the state. I feel, and I've hear from others, so it's not just my opinion, that what you guys are doing is working. The, mm -hmm. the perception of 
addiction is starting to change. The, whether it's the Ohio campaign to reduce the stigma, physicians like Dr. Borland, uh, leaders like Director Pride, talking about it as a disease state model and talking about people as people and addressing them where they are and under, trying to have an understanding of how and why things are happening, it's starting to work. So I know when you're on the front line, sometimes you can get discouraged and like, oh, does this matter? But it is the, the, the perception that we're hearing is starting to change. And I think it's because of leaders like y'all uh, sh sharing and informing and educating. So I thank you guys for doing what you do. Um, if there are no other questions, I hope I'm not missing anything. Um, there was a question about Cuyahoga County getting in oh, yes. ideas from our innovative bill. Um, yeah. I can I can get some feedback on that from our sheriff's office. Again, I know they've had a lot of inquiries, a lot of tours they've conducted. Um, so I can find out maybe who's reached out and, and really they they began to educate on the process of what they went into to get the jail. So I can I can let you know that, Barbara. Okay, great. Thank you. So as a, as a follow-up from this, we will we can send out the recording. I'll follow up with Director Pride about maybe some of these statistics. If you have someone that I could type them up real quick, I know people are interested in them. And then if you know anything about the Cuyahoga Jail, we'll include that in a follow-up uh, as well. So All right. again, thank you everybody for joining us today. And thank you so much, Director Pride and Dr. Borland for sharing your uh, expertise with us and just sharing these incredible programs that are that are going on. We'll keep looking for your, your outcomes and we hope to see them being uh, expanded there in Central Ohio, but also expanded as well. So. All right, thank you all, thank have you an all. amazing day. Take Everybody care. have a great day. Thank y'all. Bye.